Once again, you're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. Now I want to read to you an article under my view in the commentary section of my favorite magazine. Some of you already know what magazine this is because I've talked about it an awful lot on the Hour of the Time. It's Backwoods Home Magazine, edited and published by my good friend Dave Duffy up in Ashland, Oregon. It's a practical journal of self reliance. Did you hear what I said? It's a practical journal of self reliance. Self reliance. It's called Backwoods Home Magazine. This just came in the mail. I just got this out of my mailbox yesterday. It's the September October 1993 edition, edition number 23. And uh, uh, I'm going to tell you how you can subscribe to this magazine. So write this down right now, folks. All you've got to do is call this number, area code 503-488-2053. That's area code 503-488-2053. Now let me tell you some of the articles that are in this issue. Of course, there's notes from the publisher, letters, and editorial, which I'm going to read to you, called No Ideology, No Agenda. Recipes, book reviews, in this book review section they're reviewing a book called Wild Game Cookbook and American Game Cooking under magazine review they review the American Spectator just for kids how kids can grow a backwoods kitchen garden laboratory water test offer you can get your water tested real cheap through backwoods home magazine much less than it would cost you to do it on your own and you'll know exactly what you're drinking there's an index of previous issues they have some books for sale, a reader survey, subscription information, classified advertising. Uh, in this issue they have uh, building tools and housing trusses, low-cost marvels to roof over most large spaces. Tells you exactly how to do it from start to finish under alternative energy, solar panel testing and repair. If you have solar panels in your house or your home, this tells you how to test and repair those panels completely in this issue. They don't do partial articles or get you interested in something and then leave you hanging. Under self-sufficiency, food and guns, harvesting from nature, slaughtering and butchering, prepare your rifle before deer season, harvesting the black-tailed deer, nuclear superstition. Under money, planning to make a living in the country, saving is the first step to an independent country life. Under farm and garden, Here's a step-by-step -step guide to wholesome, safe canning. Annie and I learned how to can from Backwoods Home magazine over a year ago. And believe me, it has certainly helped us lower our food bills. Americana and Society, they have a complete article on the history of the Oregon Trail. And another article, Reliving the Oregon Trail. This magazine, folks, is the most fantastic magazine I've ever seen. It is my favorite magazine above all others. I can't wait for it to come in the mail. Call Dave Duffy and subscribe to this magazine now. The, it's area code 503-488-2053. 503-488-2053. I'll repeat it later in the program. And uh, tell them that you heard about Backwoods Magazine on the hour of the time. This is not a commercial, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. Backwoods Home doesn't even know I'm doing this. Dave Duffy doesn't even know I'm doing this tonight. Okay? I'm doing this because I believe in this magazine. I believe it should be in every home in America. 
every home in America. Area code 503-488-2053. Tell Dave Duffy you heard it on the hour of the time and ask him if you can still get the $2 off the subscription rate. In any case, whether you pay the full subscription or get the $2 off, it doesn't make any difference. This magazine is worth every single penny, folks. So all you got to do is call that number. They will start your subscription right away and they'll send you a bill. You don't even have to send the money first. That's the kind of person Dave Duffy is. And that's just one of the reasons why he's my good friend. Okay, let me read this article to you. This article is... <laughs> is really funny. It's called No Ideology, No Agenda. And it's kind of a spoof. And Dave Duffy has written up here, we're delighted to give this issue's editorial space over to PJ O'Rourke who delivered these comments to a gathering of the Cato Institute, a free market think tank. O'Rourke has authored several books including Parliament of Whores, a bestseller about the United States government, Congress in particular, and this article is reprinted with permission from the July 1993 American Spectator. The Cato Institute has an unusual political cause, which is no political cause whatsoever. We are here tonight to dedicate ourselves to that cause, to dedicate ourselves, in other words, to nothing. We have no ideology, no agenda, no catechism, no dialectic, no plan for humanity. We have no vision thing, as our ex-president would say, or as our current president would say, we have no Hillary. All we have is the belief that people should do what people want to do, unless it causes harm to other people, and that had better be clear and provable harm. No nonsense about secondhand smoke or hurtful, insensitive language, please. I don't know what's good for you, you don't know what's good for me, we don't know what's good for mankind, and it sometimes seems as though we're the only people who don't. It may well be that gathered right here in this room tonight are all the people in the world who don't want to tell all the people in the world what to do. This is because we believe in freedom. Freedom, what this country was established upon, what the Constitution was written to defend, what the Civil War was fought to perfect. Freedom is not empowerment. Empowerment is what the Serbs have in Bosnia. Anybody can grab a gun and be empowered. It's not entitlement. And entitlement is what people on welfare get. And how free are they? It's not an endlessly expanding list of rights. The right to education. The right to health care. The right to food and housing. That's not freedom. That's dependency. And most people never learn that. Those aren't rights. Those are the rations of slavery, hay and a barn for human cattle. There is only one basic human right, the right to do as you damn well please, and with it comes the only basic human duty, the duty to take the consequences. So, we are here tonight in a kind of antimatter protest, an unpolitical undemonstration by deeply uncommitted inactivists. We are part of a huge, invisible picket line that circles the White House 24 hours a day. We are participants in an enormous non-march on Washington. Millions and millions of Americans not descending upon the nation's capital in order to demand nothing from the United States government. To demand nothing, that is, except the one thing which no government in history has been able to do, and that is, leave us alone. Leave us alone. There are just two rules of governance in a free society. One, mind your own business, and two, keep your hands to yourself. Bill Clinton, keep your hands to yourself. Hillary, mind your own business. We have a group of incredibly silly people in the White House right now. People who think government works, or that government would work, if you got some real bright young kids from Yale to run it. We're being governed by dorm room bull session. The Clinton administration is over there right now pulling an all-nighter in the West Wing. They think that if they can just stay up late enough, they can create a healthy economy and bring peace to former Yugoslavia. The Clinton administration is going to decrease government spending by increasing the amount of money we give to the government to spend. Makes sense, doesn't it? Health care is too expensive, so the Clinton administration is putting a high-powered corporate lawyer in charge of making it cheaper. Now, this is what I always do when I want to spend less money, hire a lawyer from Yale. Now, if you think health care is expensive now, wait until you see what it costs when it's free. 
The Clinton administration is putting together a program so that college graduates can work to pay off their school tuition. As if this were some genius idea. It's called getting a job. Most folks do that when they get out of college, unless, of course, they happen to become governor of Arkansas. And the Clinton administration launched an attack on people in Texas because those people were religious nuts with guns. Hell, this country was founded by religious nuts with guns. Who does Bill Clinton think stepped ashore on Plymouth Rock? Peace Corps volunteers? Or maybe the people in Texas were attacked because of child abuse. But if child abuse was the issue, why didn't Janet Reno tear gas Woody Allen? You know, if government were a product, selling it would be illegal. Government is a health hazard. Governments have killed many more people than cigarettes or unbuckled seat belts ever have. Government contains impure ingredients, as anybody who's looked at Congress can tell you. On the basis of Bill Clinton's 1992 campaign promises, I think we can say government practices deceptive advertising. And the merest glance at the federal budget is enough to convict the government of perjury, extortion, and fraud. There, ladies and gentlemen, you have the Cato Institute's program in a nutshell. Government should be against the law. Term limits aren't enough. We need jail. Again, that was written by P.J. O'Rourke. Well, folks, I'm going to take you one step further in your education tonight. I am holding in my hands, dear listeners, an old, very old book, published in 1883 in Philadelphia by Collins and McDill. The name of this book is In the Coils or The Coming Conflict. Again, this book was published in 1883 in Philadelphia by Collins and McDill. The title is In the Coils or The Coming Conflict by E. B. G. This is the second edition, which means there was an edition before this. And there's a quote here by Wendell Phillips, who says, This is the next great question that the nation must take up and decide. And this book, ladies and gentlemen, is priceless, for it describes, it was originally uh, copyrighted in 1882, actually not copyrighted, but entered according to Act of Congress in the year 1882 by A.T. McDill in the office of the Librarian of Congress at Washington, D.C. So if you can't find this anywhere else, it is in the Library of Congress. This is about one man's battle with Freemasonry. And I'm going to read to you a letter which begins on page 237. This letter is written by Dr. Groves and sent to a Mr. Dover. Brandon, May 18th. My dear friend, I have delayed a reply to your note in order that I might be able to answer both your questions fully and with some degree of certainty. I am glad to be able to say that I am personally acquainted with your nephew and that I highly esteem him. I have consulted several influential men in our village and we all agree in our opinion of Bates and his prospects in this precinct. So I can answer both of your questions together and use the plural we and our instead of showing you mine opinion alone. We believe Bates to be the best candidate in the field as yet and it is possible that he will have our hearty support. We are not altogether satisfied with any of our candidates, but we do not expect to find one that will suit us in every particular. We may consistently support a person and yet have some objection to him. So in regard to Bates, we have one serious objection to him, but whether that will be in our way of supporting him depends upon circumstances. I suppose you want a plain statement of the whole matter rather than any uncertain and flattering promises and I will not be kept back by fear of offending you or by a desire for office or popularity from stating clearly our objection to Bates and the circumstances in which he may probably expect our support. We do not object to his abilities, moral character, republicanism, relatives, or general fitness for the place. We appreciate him for all these. Our only objection to him is that by certain and numerous oaths which he considers binding, 
We do not, however. He has pledged his support to a monopoly which is more powerful and dangerous than those which he professes to oppose, and has sworn his allegiance to a government which claims supremacy over all other authority, whether of church or state. In a word, as we are informed, Mr. Bates is a Freemason. Now we know that everyone who enters the Lodge swears, quote, to support the constitution of the Grand Lodge of the State and to conform to the laws of any Lodge of which he shall be a member, and also to obey all regular signs, summons, or tokens from any Mason or body of Masons. Now, whatever he may be told before taking this oath, after he does so, he is taught that the authority of the Lodge is absolute, the covenant is irrevocable, and its obligations are supreme. In General Ahiman Rizan, or the Freemason's Guide, we read, quote, The candidate entering the Lodge is on the point of binding himself voluntarily, absolutely, and without reservation forever. Webb's Monitor says, the covenant is irrevocable. Even though a mason may be suspended or expelled, though he may withdraw from the lodge, journey into countries where masons cannot be found, or become a subject of despotic governments that persecute, a communicant of bigoted churches that denounce masonry, he cannot cast off or nullify his masonic covenant. No law of the land can affect it, no anathema of the church can weaken it, it is irrevocable." Unquote. Again, this same Masonic author says, quote, The first duty of the reader of this synopsis is to obey the edicts of his Grand Lodge, right or wrong, his very existence as a Mason hangs upon obedience to the power immediately set above him. Failure in this must infallibly bring down expulsion, which as a Masonic death ends all. The one unpardonable crime in a Mason is contumacy or disobedience." Unquote. Although it takes much space in my letter, let me give you more testimony with the names of the witnesses who are all eminent members of the order and high in authority, and some of whose works are in nearly every lodge and necessarily have some effect on the members. Quote, that this surrender of free will to Masonic authority is absolute within the scope of the landmarks of the order and perpetual may be inferred from an examination of the emblem, the shoe or sandal, which is used to enforce this lesson of resignation." Unquote. That's from the Morris Dictionary of Freemasonry. Quote, "...disobedience is so subversive of the groundwork of Masonry, in which obedience is so strongly inculcated, that the Mason who disobeys subjects himself to severe penalties." Unquote. I bid. Quote, a grand lodge is invested with power and authority over all the craft within its jurisdiction. It is the supreme court of appeals in all Masonic cases, and to its degrees, unlimited obedience must be paid by every lodge and every mason situated within its control. The government of grand lodges is, therefore, completely despotic. While a grand lodge exists, its edicts must be respected and obeyed without examination by its subordinate lodges." Unquote. That's from Mackey, Lexicon of Freemasonry, page 183. Quote, For ourselves we deny as Masons that any civil government on earth has the right to divide or curtail Masonic jurisdiction when once established. It can only be done by competent Masonic authority and in accordance with Masonic usage." Unquote. From the Grand Lodge Report. Quote, a due summons from the Lodge or Grand Lodge is obligatory upon him, and should he refuse obedience, he will be disgracefully expelled from the society with public marks of ignominy that can never be erased." Unquote. That's from the Morris, Dictionary of Freemasonry, page number 29. Quote, Disobedience and want of respect to Masonic superiors is an offense for which the transgressor subjects himself to punishment. Unquote. That's from Mackey, Masonic Jurisprudence, page 511. Quote, Hence we find that the master's authority in the lodge is as despotic as the sun in the firmament which was placed there by the Creator never to deviate from its accustomed course till the declaration is promulgated that time shall be no more. Unquote. 
That's from Oliver's Signs and Symbols of Freemasonry, page 142. Quote, Treason and rebellion also, because they are altogether political offenses, cannot be inquired into by a lodge, and although a mason may be convicted of either of these acts in the courts of his country, he cannot be masonically punished, and notwithstanding his treason or rebellion, his relation to the lodge, to use the language of the old charges, remains indefeasible. Unquote. That's from Mackey's Masonic Jurisprudence, page 510. I'm going to read that again, and I want you to pay close attention. Quote, Treason and rebellion also, because they are altogether political offenses, cannot be inquired into by a lodge. And although a mason may be convicted of either of these acts in the courts of his country, he cannot be masonically punished. And notwithstanding his treason or rebellion, his relation to the lodge, to use the language of the old charges, remains indefeasible. Unquote. That's from Mackey, Juris, Masonic Jurisprudence, page 510. Quote, There is no duty more forcibly enjoined in Masonry than that of warning a brother of danger impending to his person or interests. To neglect this is a positive violation of obligation and destroys any person's claim to be entitled a Mason. Unquote. That's from Morris's Dictionary of Freemasonry, page 325. Quote, the powers and privileges of the master of a lodge are by no means limited in extent. Unquote. That's from Chase's Digest of Masonic Law, page 380. Quote, As a presiding officer, the master is possessed of extraordinary powers which belong to the presiding officer of no other association. Unquote. That's from Mackey, Masonic Jurisprudence, page 344. Quote, the system of Masonic law has little of the Republican or Democratic spirit about it. Unquote. That's from Morris, Webb's Freemasons Monitor, Revised Edition, page 195. Quote, once a Mason, always a Mason. Once a Mason, everywhere a Mason, however independent, either as individuals or as lodges whether grand or subordinate, and we are each and all truly free and uncontrolled by anything save our ancient laws and constitution. Yet no Mason can be a foreigner to another Mason. We are all equal citizens of one common government, having equal rights, equal privileges, and equal duties, and in which government, thank God, the majority does not govern. For our order, in its very constitution, strikes at the root of that which is the very basis of popular government. It proclaims and practices not that the will of the masses is wise and good, and as such to be obeyed, not that the majority shall govern, but that the law, in effect above mentioned ancient law, shall govern. Our tenet is not only that no single man, but that no body of men, however wise or numerous, can change in any degree one single landmark of our ancient institution. Our law is strictly organic. It cannot be changed without being destroyed. You may take a man to pieces, and you may take a watch to pieces, but you cannot alter his organs and put him together again, as you do the timekeeper. Masonry is the living man, and all other forms of government mere convenient machines made by clever mechanics for regulating the affairs of state. Not only do we know no north, no south, no east, and no west, but we know no government save our own. To every government save that of masonry, and to each and all alike, we are foreigners. And this form of government is neither pontifical, autocratic, monarchical, republican, democratic, nor despotic. It is a government per se, and that government is Masonic. We have nothing to do with forms of government, forms of religion, or forms of social life. We are a nation of men only bound to each other by Masonic ties as citizens of the world, and that world, the world of Masonry. Brethren to each other, all the world over, foreigners to all the world beside. The above is a Masonic address in a nutshell. It is the compressed essence of Masonic life. Unquote. It's taken from the Missouri Grand Lodge Report for 1867. 
What a remarkable array of Masonic testimony, and yet the half has not been told. I might go on almost indefinitely showing its foul, treasonable, and anti-republican nature as legibly portrayed under these extracts from standard Masonic publications. The above sentences are complete quotations and not garbled. They are concise and plain. The language is authoritative. Masonic superiors never argue with subordinates they dictate. No wonder a most prominent member admits the following. Quote, there is no charge more frequently made against Freemasonry than that of its tendency to revolution and conspiracy and to political organizations which may affect the peace of society or interfere with the rights of government. Unquote. Taken from Mackey, Mystic Ties of Freemasonry, page 43. Remember, my friend Dover, that I am not speaking of your nephew's personal views of the supremacy of the Lodge, nor saying what he would do if he should find that some of the law's summonses or orders of the Lodge should conflict with his duties to the government, but merely showing you what the Lodge, according to its standard author's claims, and what every Mason has sworn to perform. If Mr. Bates should go to Congress and then find in some cases that he must violate either his official oath or Masonic obligation, I do not say which he would consider binding. But I do say, for I know that the Lodge, by its writers, its lecturers, and its decrees, declares that its obligations are supreme, its authority above all civil authority, and obedience to his superiors the first duty of every Mason. If eminent members know and tell the truth about their own order, if Grand Lodge reports can be believed, there can be no doubt on this point. Please read again carefully what these have said. Yes, dared to print, and you will see our objection to sending Bates to Congress or electing him or any Mason to any office until he renounces his allegiances to the Lodge. Do you think that we demand too much? Every other foreigner, before he is allowed even to vote, must renounce his allegiance to the government under which he was born, and to which perhaps he has never sworn or acknowledged obedience. We require of him, and properly, the following obligation. Quote, I do declare an oath that it is bona fide my intention to become a citizen of the United States and to renounce and abjure forever all allegiance and fidelity to all and every foreign prince, potentate, state, and sovereign, and particularly blank, fill in whatever country he came from, of whom I am a subject, unquote. Is it then right for free citizens of this country to vote into any office a person who has sworn and still lives under and acknowledges allegiance to another, a monarchical and a despotic government? Has not the Grand Lodge of one state, in consistency with the general teaching of Masonry, declared that all its members are foreigners to our government? Let us then consider them as such, and our government also should consider them as such, and forbid them to hold office, sit on the jury, or even to vote until they take the oath prescribed for other foreigners. When I tell you that the most puissant sovereign grand commander of the United States, of whom every Mason in the country is a sworn subject, is an ex-Confederate general whose rebel hands are deeply dyed by the crimson blood of loyal citizens, and who at one battle of the late war led a brigade of Indians against the boys in blue, who by these cruel savages were murdered, scalped, and mutilated in a manner too barbarous for description, you will see more force in this argument. And why was not the arch traitor, the leader of the rebellion, hung when captured? He and the President of the United States and many congressmen and judges were royal arch masons and had sworn each to the following. Quote, Furthermore, do I promise and swear that I will aid and assist a companion royal arch mason when engaged in any difficulty, and espouse his cause so far as to extricate him from the same, if in my power, whether he be right or wrong." Unquote. Is it not reasonable, then, to suppose that these men, who had sworn to fulfill their duties as civil officers, chose rather to obey Masonic obligations and extricate a rebel from his difficulty? This is the only explanation of this strange event which is worthy of any consideration, and it is made more certain when we remember that, according to Mackey's jurisprudence, Treason and rebellion also, because they are altogether political offenses, cannot be inquired into by the Lodge.
These facts concerning the oaths and teachings of the Lodge will explain many other strange things in the history of our country. They will often explain why some improper person is nominated and elected to some office, or the illegal contestant is given the seat, or a criminal is acquitted or pardoned and perhaps promoted. Why was our present representative, who you say has not brains enough to be a pettifogging lawyer, and who is notoriously dishonest, sent to Congress? Why was he nominated by our party? In answer to this question, the WASP, whose editor is an anti-monopolist, but also inconsistently a Mason, says, quote, because as the superintendent of our main railway told a prominent man before the convention which nominated him, the present incumbent was this company's most available candidate because he was high up in masonry, unquote. Thus he admits that the lodge is used for the purpose of securing improper nominations and electing to office unworthy men, and certainly implies that it is used to control them while in office. So you see our objection to any Mason going to Congress, and our only objection to the nomination of Mr. Bates. The one condition on which we will give him our united and hearty support is that he goes before the clerk of the United States Court and takes the oath required of all foreigners, inserting the word Freemason masonry in the blank. I have given you freely and honestly a lengthy statement of this case, but if there is anything further you desire to know, I would be glad to answer your inquiries. I should be glad to receive a visit from you at any time. Yours, Warren Groves, in our Dover, Princeton. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you understand the import of what I have just read to you, and I hope that you understand that many of the leaders in the Patriot community are Freemasons. They are sworn to the order, to their one world government of which they only are citizens. And they have no allegiance to any other government, organization, oath, creed, or religion. By their own writings, their own word. Everything that I have quoted that was written in this letter was written or published prior to 1882. The farther back you go in history, the more truth you can read in their words for they have learned that some of us are smarter than they think. And now they conveniently delete some of this from their modern writing, but even in their modern writing you can find enough to incriminate and hang them all. The Confederate general discussed in this letter by Dr. Groves is none other than Albert Pike. And to show you that they are everywhere controlling everything and that you are being brainwashed, when is the last time that you really listened to Star Trek? When is the last time you really listened to the message of Star Trek? When is the last time you understood that the people portrayed in Star Trek owned no private property? <laughs> and everything in that series is Marxism. Pure socialism, pure and simple. And what is the message of Star Trek? Go rent the movies in the series and watch them one by one, starting with the Star Trek movie and ending with the last one that was made. And you will very quickly come to your senses, especially when you realize that Captain James T. Kirk, when he came upon the scene, relieved one Captain Albert Pike. The initials of Captain James T. Kirk, backwards, are K.T.J., Knights of the Temple of Jerusalem. Lieutenant Colonel James Bogreitz is a 32nd degree Freemason of the Scottish Rite. Get your heads out of your collective asses. Good night, and God bless you all.